Hello, my name is Josh Brumberg. I'm the Dean for the Sciences here at the Graduate Center. When thinking about the pandemic, we are all looking for silver linings. One such example is tonight's webinar, where I can welcome a larger crowd online than we could have hosted in person at the Graduate Center for the important discussion about the ethics of artificial intelligence, or as we more commonly refer to it, AI. As a public university, the Graduate Center and its associated Advanced Science Research Center are committed to the idea that our scientific research has a role in advancing the public good. To help us understand the ethics of artificial intelligence and how AI is increasingly intersecting with our daily lives, I am very happy to introduce tonight's panel. First is Dr. Vincent Conitzer, who is the Kimberly J. Jenkins Distinguished University Professor of New Technologies, as well as a Professor of Computer Science, Economics, and Philosophy at Duke University, as well as being a Professor of Computer Science and Philosophy at the University of Oxford. His work, he works broadly in the field of AI, working on designing algorithms that optimize resource utilization, and more recently has begun to explore what are the objectives that AI systems should pursue. Next up is Dr. Jillian Hadfield, who holds the Schwartz Reisman Chair in Technology and Society and is a professor of law and strategic management and the director of the Schwartz Reisman Institute for Technology and Society at the University of Toronto. She has spoken and consulted widely on how laws and policy can become much better attuned to advances in technology such as AI. Our next panelist is IBM fellow and IBM AI's ethics global leader, Dr. Francesca Rossi, who is based at the IBM TJ Watson Research Lab here in New York. Her research focuses on AI and its role in decision making. She is a founding board member of the Partnership on AI and as of next year will be the president of the Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence. Our final panelist is Dr. Julie Shaw, who is the Associate Dean of Social and Ethical Responsibilities Computing, as well as a Professor of Aeronautics, Astronautics, and Computer Science at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Dr. Shaw utilizes AI to improve the efficiency of human-robot interactions in safety-critical domains such as medical surgery and space exploration. Leading tonight's discussion is Dr. Susan Epstein, a professor of computer science at Hunter College and the Graduate Center CUNY. Her research in AI focuses on knowledge representation, how to represent the world to computer and how computers can learn. She serves as an executive counselor for the Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence. Before turning over the virtual microphone to Susan, a few words about how tonight's event will unfold. Susan will lead our panelists in discussion. I'm sure many of you will have questions which I invite you to submit in the Q&A function within Zoom and we will do our best to get to as many as we can during the latter part of the event. My job is done. And I'm going to join all of you in listening to Susan guide us through what I'm sure will be a fascinating discussion. Good night and enjoy. Thank you so much, Josh. Good evening, everyone and welcome. In the summer of 1956, a small group of people met in New Hampshire to consider how they might, and I'm going to quote, program a calculator to form concepts and generalizations. Their expertise ranged widely, computer science, engineering, mathematics, logic, and physics, but also economics, political science, cognitive psychologists, psychology, psychiatry, and neurophysiology. They called their meeting the Dartmouth Summer Research Project on Artificial Intelligence. Those of us who work in AI today use computers, not calculators, to build what we call agents. Fundamentally, an agent is a program that runs a sense, decide, act loop over and over again. The agent senses its world, chooses an action, executes that action, and then repeats the whole process. Sense, decide, act. For an agent, sensing is receiving data from its world. Because an agent's sensors are different from our own, the agent necessarily experiences the world differently. Moreover, an agent's sensory experience is limited to what its creators allow. 
If the agent only experiences green apples, it will be much less likely to recognize a red one. Sense, decide, act. For an agent, actions are intended to affect the outside world. An agent can buy stock or prescribe medicine, but it only executes the actions programmers provide for it. An agent may speak or write, or if it's embodied, uh, like a robot, then it might even move through this world. And because it strings together these actions, an agent may behave in ways that we did not anticipate. To the degree that we grant that agent autonomy, we want that behavior to be in some ways acceptable. Sense, decide, act, at the core of that loop is the decision process itself. We create agents to make choices. An agent might choose its next chess move or diagnose why your car won't start or predict tomorrow's weather. An ambitious agent might learn from its experience or create a long-term plan to execute a sequence of actions. The agent's thought processes, if you will, are in the hands of its creators. As the computers it relies on have become more powerful, AI has demonstrated increasing prowess on difficult problems. Agents have learned to play chess and go and some varieties of poker better than any human. They also do crossword puzzles, read handwriting, diagnose skin cancer, and recognize photos of objects about as well as we do. And NASA uses agents to operate rover explorers and autonomous spacecraft that observe Earth and travel in deep space. Every new scientific field, however, has had unanticipated ramifications. Electricity, for example, was harnessed to light up our world. Few people might have foreseen light pollutions or changes in circadian rhythms, and AI is no exception. Ethical issues arise when we misrepresent our world to an agent. A face recognition agent that learned only on white males proved less trustworthy on females and people of color. An agent intended to help judges decide whether or not to grant bail was found to be biased against African-Americans. And an agent that learned to watch for successful applicants from their word use on applications learned the words to watch for from the original applications of outstanding current employees, 75% of whom were men. Ethical issues also arise when an agent decides and acts in ways its creators have not anticipated. This is particularly prevalent in the interpretation of what we see or think of as visual data, such as what an autonomous car sees. Indeed, the degree to which we grant an agent autonomy is a pressing question. And tonight we are privileged to discuss ethics in AI with four distinguished guests. So we're going to start right in. I have some questions for them. And eventually we'll give the audience an opportunity to ask questions too. All right, so my first question is, I've just indicated some biases, some pretty strong ones. I left out the names of those companies, but many of us probably recognize the story. Um, how should we address biases in intelligent agents? Anyone who would like to start? I think Francesca should start. Sure, I can start. So, um, so as you say, uh, first of all, there are many ways in which bias can be um, inside an AI system. Um, it can be because of, as in your example, because of the data that you train this AI system, uh, this agent uh, is not uh, well representing all the possible, you know, uh, uh, groups of population that uh, then later when the system is deployed is going to have to 
consider. Or it can be also injected in any other decision that the designer or, or the developer is going to make during the, 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 all the steps uh, in the development of this AI system. So, so since uh, uh, human beings have a lot of cognitive biases when we make decisions and some of them we are not aware of, then it's very important that these people creating the AI system need to be you know, a, a, a more aware, more educated about about the possible bias that they can inject in various parts of this AI system. So the education and the training of these people is essential. Um, of course, then it's important to have the right tools, uh, the right tools to detect and mitigate bias in this AI system. So that's a technological solution, which is, however, in some sense, the easy part. The technological tools are the easy part, even though they have a lot of dimension because the tools, like in a company like IBM, we have proprietary tools, we have open source tools, and then we have some written in Python for those that are doing Python, some written in other languages. So it's a whole space, but the tools really is the easy part, is the education, is the consultation with all the important stakeholders, because, for example, bias means that you have in mind a certain notion of fairness. And to identify the right notion of fairness, you need to consult with the client, with the impacted community, to make sure you, you are trying to achieve that notion of fairness and not another one. In the example that you give about the uh, algorithm to predict the recidivism, uh, you know, and uh, in that case, there were two notion of fairness. If you were looking at just one, like the same, the accuracy related fairness, you could see that there was more or less the same accuracy for the two groups of the population. But then if you went and looked at the, the false positive and false negatives, there where you saw the big disparity in the two population groups. So identifying the right notion of fairness cannot be done by AI developers alone, but it has to be done in consultation. And then since, uh, since the, uh, uh, the bias can be mitigated, identified, but not necessarily eliminated, especially because not, it may, usually it's not just one bias, but a lot of intersectionality issues between different forms of bias that you want to eliminate, then you need to be transparent and you need to add, uh, add ex transparency and explainability so that it's important at least to be able to see what bias is still there and to relate it to the output, to the decision that this agent is going to make. One thing that I want to conclude in what you said, Susan, I would not say that these issues are relevant only when uh, machines make uh, autonomous decisions, but they're also relevant when machines are recommending decisions to support a human being to, to make decisions, like a decision support system for a doctor or for uh, somebody working in a bank or a judge. So, so because even in that case, you want this human being to be able to understand why this system is making these recommendations and whether there are some biases involved there. So it's very important in that context uh, as well. Um, okay, that's a great answer. Uh, someone want to add to that? I'm happy to jump in and add to that and especially build on, um, on Francesca's last point. Uh, you know, my, my research is in human machine collaboration. I develop AI models that uh, model people to facilitate more effective collaboration and work in collaborative robots and in, in decision support for experts like doctors, nurses, and, and, and fighter pilots. And, um, you know, you have to think carefully about what the relative strengths of humans and machines are. And uh, one of the ways I, I like to parse it is um, you know, our, our natural human ability um, that a machine cannot take over for the foreseeable future is our ability to structure an unstructured problem. Once we've structured that problem, the machine can kind of crush it. Uh, but then that, you know, where, where is bias? Bias comes from uh, all of the ways that humans structure the problem for the machine. And people immediately jump to bias and data. And that is one very important way, one way that's uh, very hard for us to see often, you know, in robotics, you know, we, uh, you know, in, in um, you know, a, a, an object detector can work really well on images or videos that are um, controlled by a person uh, because we have an attention mechanism, but you put it on a robot that's just sweeping through the space and suddenly it doesn't work nearly as well. That's one way we structure the world for, for our machines. Um, but as Francesca mentioned, um, all through the data, um, 
the, the data acquisition pipeline, we have ways in which, um, but, but every role a person plays in choosing a model and crafting that model and selecting features, these are other forms of bias that are introduced. Um, and then similarly, beyond that stream in, um, in a evaluation and deployment, we have evaluation bias and deployment bias. And, um, uh, and, and that, that's particularly challenging. My background is in an aerospace engineer. And you know, as an engineer, a civil engineer, any type of engineer, you're trained to um, be wary of the situation in which you extrapolate beyond the bounds of your models. And one of the very challenging things about AI today is it's very hard for us to understand the bounds of the model. Often they're used in situations that don't correspond precisely to the, uh, the way we've trained them, the distribution of the data. Uh, and, um, and, uh, and ultimately we're designing for a system to accept or reject a recommendation, trust in that automation and importantly calibrated trust is key. It's key to uh, pilots interacting with cockpit automation. It's key to every use of AI. AI isn't designed to function on its own. Um, and calibrating that trust is, is very, very challenging. And there are very important sources of bias through that process that need to be very carefully attended to. Great, okay, anyone else? I'll jump in. Uh, so everything Francesca and Julie said was great, uh, and I'll, I'll echo, echo some of that. In particular, this idea that bias can creep in in many ways, and also there are many different types of bias, right? So some are really easy to see as disadvantaging a group of people, right? If a group of people consistently does not get their resume classified as being worthy of an interview, you can easily see how that disadvantages them. Uh, it's maybe a little harder to see if a technology just doesn't work that well for a group of people, right? You mentioned face recognition. Uh, and so we've seen a lot of examples where face recognition does not work as well on darker skinned people. But at first people might respond to that and say, well, so what? Right? Maybe, maybe that's a nice thing. Maybe I like the idea of not being tracked by cameras and AI everywhere. Uh, but then during the pandemic, one thing we saw was that uh, many exams started to be run online, including some state bar exams. Uh, and for, for those high stakes exams, uh, some of the companies started to use AI to track the person on their camera. Right? So if you wanted to take the exam, you had to sit in front of your camera and the AI would track that it was still you in front of the camera. Mm -hmm. Uh, now, wouldn't you know it, that didn't work as well on darker skinned people who, in order to get this technology to work, had to have very bright lights shining on them, right? And I don't know if you've ever tried to take an exam with very bright lights shining on you, but I imagine that's not uh, very advantageous. So I think it's, it's very important to be aware of the many different ways in which this kind of unfair bias can come in. Uh, and so as Francesca and Julie said, we need people to be aware of that and bring up those issues. Uh, one thing that I think maybe hasn't come up so much yet is that we also need to think about incentives to fix it, right? And that really varies from one industry to another, right? In some cases, like if the technology doesn't work so well for some group of people, in some cases it might fix itself uh, because there's obvious business value to actually getting the technology also to work on a broader group of people. But in other cases, that incentive just may really not be there. Right? And some of these things have been around for a long time, even you, know, you can argue about whether it's AI or not, but you could think, for example, about applying for a credit card uh, if you're an immigrant. Right? Typically, if you wanna apply for a credit card as an immigrant into the United States, uh, it's hard to do because you have no US credit history. Maybe you have some history, uh, some credit history where you came from, but typically they're not able to take that into account. Uh, and that continues to be an issue, right? Um, so it's not always so easy to fix these issues, even if people are aware of them. Uh, and so that's why we should think about incentives to fix them. Let me, let me also jump in here. Um, so I, I'm on this panel with, with computer scientists, which is wonderful. I spend a lot of my days collaborating with computer scientists, but I'm a social scientist and a, a legal scholar. And one of the things I think it's really important to keep in mind when we're thinking about bias in AI is that bias, uh, AI is like everything else in our society. We we want to have rules in place and processes in place to monitor, to incentivize, to provide redress. And, and part of the work that I've been doing in trying to think about how are we gonna build AI systems that are more fair, more aligned with what we want is to think kind of outside of the box of how could you build the AI differently? So all the things that Julie and Francesca and Vince have talked about involve really important things like thinking about your data pipeline, thinking about who your engineers are running, what kinds of tests are you running? But I think we also wanna think kind of outside the environment outside that and say, what kinds of rules do we have in place 
So what kinds of processes do we have in place for auditing the performance of our systems, for providing uh, redress when our systems are not are working in a biased way? And I think this is deeply connected to sort of the, way the fundamental way that we think about the way law works is we have opportunities in our legal systems, and, and this is actually much more general than filing lawsuits. This is also in our organizations. This is in our families. This is, we have a way in which we say, hey, you know, I don't think that was a justified decision that you made. I should have been admitted. I should have got a bigger piece of cake. Um, mm. I, you know, I should have got the job. And we have structured processes for obtaining the justifications and reasons and for examining those reasons and saying, are they acceptable or not? So, so when I think about the challenges of bias in AI, I also think, how are we going to design the systems that can review our, the way our AI works? Uh, Francesca, and I'm, I'm probably Julie and Vince mentioned this as well, but mentioned explainability, right? Which is how do we, how do we, you know, can, how do we build our systems so that they can help us understand why they've done what they've done so that we can actually look into it and say, no, 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 you weren't supposed to ba base the loan decision on zip codes because we know that zip codes are correlated with income or with, uh, with race or other variables. So I think I, I like to think about the, first of all, AI is biased because we're all biased and we've designed all kinds of systems to address that judicial independence review systems, publicity, uh, all of those kinds of processes. So how are we gonna integrate AI into those systems in order to provide that kind of oversight? I think there's lots of great technical solutions as well, but we're not limited to technical solutions. Yeah, if you can add the Susan uh, to this, uh, to follow up of what Gillian just said. Yeah. Yes, the, you know, the, the, it's very important to understand that uh, uh, one can uh, envision all these pieces that need to be put in place, the technical tools, uh, the education of the, uh, the developers, uh, maybe even the diversity of the teams, you know, all these issues, uh, so partial solutions that complement each other. But the big challenge actually is to uh, build the governance around this, all these things, you know, like to build a, an ecosystem that within a company, I see that in my every day job, but also then in a country or even more globally, that really has uh, uh, all the right incentives uh, and uh, capabilities to put all these pieces together. For example, just a very simple examples, you know, developers uh, before uh, the use of AI and uh, uh, the realization that there was this issue of bias and you needed to tackle it and to address it in some way, they were developing their models, you know, they were building building their AI agent uh, without thinking about bias. They were thinking, you know, like in everywhere, uh, that more data was better you know, for the model. But they were already thinking about some uh, integrated processes, for example, for security and for privacy. Those were already in place before we thought about bias. Then we came and we said, oh, now you have to add also the bias detection and mitigation integrated into your thing. But it's not that easy. They don't want to have another cycle of checks to, to go through. You have to integrate it into what they have already. So the system has to be very sleek and very agile for them. So this is within a company, but also in a society, of course, is even more complex. And actually today is the day that the European Commission published their new regulation for AI. And I mean, now is I'm sure that not many people have looked at it already because it's very new, but there are all sorts of uh, approaches to try to get uh, to mitigate these risks uh, in a risk-based approach. They have four level of risk and so on. So to understand when really uh, a bias, for example, agent is risky or at a higher level or not, because if it's very risky, then you want to put in place a lot of checks and balances and so on. Otherwise, you want to do maybe something more agile. So it's a very, very complex uh, uh, um, challenge to really build this governance around uh, the, uh, the technology. Okay, well, that was, th th that's quite an answer to, to that, my one question. So I have one more. <laughs> um, listening to you all, uh, 
it's very clear that what we're concerned about in some, on some level is aligning an agent with our own values. But we want to have the agent share our values. But I'm also one, I'd like to know how to do that, but I'm also wondering to what extent that alignment should be personalized. Imagine the following. You have an autonomous car faced with a situation where it must either hit a child on a bicycle or smash itself directly into a tree. Those are the only two options at this point. Should we have the option to make decisions like these when we buy a car in 20 years? I, I'm, it'll be at least 20, I'm beginning to believe. Okay. Can I, can I, start, can I start on that one? Yes, um, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> So, so I, I think a lot about uh, many of us think a lot about the uh, the alignment problem, how to align. But but you started off by saying align with our values, and then your question about the the trolley problem and should we be able to personalize? And and I think it's really important to recognize. That's why I said to emphasize, you know, we we the alignment problem for AI is like the alignment problem we have throughout all of our complex systems. This is. Markets are a way of aligning with, you know, what product we build and which apartments will who get and so on. And they work to some extent and they don't work to others. Our political systems, our democracies, our alignment systems that figure out how are we going to decide, you know, whether we build subsidized housing or, um, uh, you know, where are we going to invest dollars, how we're going to respond to the pandemic. Those are political systems or alignment. And so when I think about the alignment problem in AI, I say, okay, it's, you know, there's some things that will be aligning with an individual, but to a large extent, we're looking at how do we align with our collective decision-making processes? And so when the, the personalized point about the trolley problem, they say, well, we actually don't allow anybody to make those change, those choices right now. We have traffic laws and we have negligence rules and we have criminal law that sets the standards within the community for what's an acceptable choice. Um, now we could decide this is something you can you could set the lever on by on your own. I'm not sure I want to get on the roads with anybody else getting to decide that. I'm thinking that's going to be something we want our democratic institutions to decide, and then that will be a function of regulation. So I, I'm just kind of coming back to my my theme. I think are really big. There are definitely huge technical challenges in, in solving alignment in uh, problems in, in AI, but they're also significantly, how are we gonna build the regulatory structures that will, that will get us there? I think that's actually a deeply integrated legal and technical question. And that's, that's you know, our, our work at the Institute I run is to try and really get that integrated work going to say, how are we gonna regulate that? How are we gonna audit that? How are we gonna incentivize, as Vince noted at the beginning, our companies to build Mm -hmm. uh, the technology that will allow us to audit, to see, uh, to, and to have those, you know, have the decisions made in democratic ways. I just don't think our social media platforms, for example, should be deciding um, a lot of the questions they're deciding with their recommender systems or their content moderation systems. We have to figure out how to get that into democratic processes, I believe. So if I can jump in, I agree with everything that Jillian said, but I do think there's something new to AI, which is that you have to be so precise and explicit in specifying what it is that you've agreed on, right? Uh, so in AI, many AI algorithms <clears throat> at some level require what we call an objective function, which is some way of scoring how good the outcomes are that the system has obtained, right? Uh, many AI algorithms require this. And historically, in, in the history of AI, as it was mostly research, we didn't have to worry about this too much because it wasn't really deployed anyway. I love this example of uh, the pole cart problem. This is a, an, a toy problem in AI where you have a cart on a track and on the cart, there is a hinge uh, that, con that connects to a pole. Uh, and so it's loose. And the only thing you can do is you can move the cart back and forth on the track. And your goal is to keep the pole upright, right? Kind of like, you know, balancing a pencil on your hand. Uh, and so, that was kind of a toy problem that people used to develop the techniques. And there you have to specify some kind of objective function. And it could be, for example, you lose a point every time that the, that the pole falls down. Or you could say, well, you know, if the angle uh, gets large, then that costs you some points. Uh, but the real thing is, like, it doesn't really matter. Nobody is really trying to balance poles on carts in the real world, right? 
So there was not much incentive to really think about what the objective function should be. Uh, but then when it gets deployed, that same kind of mindset of like, we'll just come up with something fairly sensible quick uh, definitely has downsides, right? So you can think, for example, exactly about content recommendation systems. And so how do you decide whether the algorithm recommended some good content, right? Like on your Facebook feed or whether it was a good search result. Well, one thing you could do is say, well, if somebody clicks on it, apparently that was a good recommendation. So that's how we're going to score it. Uh, and that's, you know, maybe to a first approximation works pretty well, but then you get problems like clickbait and other things. Uh, so that's the kind of issue that we face, right? And again, traditionally in the AI community, we've kind of thought that, well, you know, somebody eventually will come around and tell us what the objective function should be. And, but that person turns out doesn't exist. And, and moreover, it needs to be this very mathematical thing. Uh, so we, we in our research have thought a little bit about how do you uh, try to get these kind of objective functions from people with more natural types of queries that they can answer, uh, unlike the question of, well, what should the objective function be? But I do wonder, to some extent, I think, you know, our elected representatives should have a hand in this as, at well, as well. But they also, you, most of them don't have the mathematical training to say, well, you know, this is not a good mathematical model of what we want. So maybe at some level, we need some kind of like mathematical representatives uh, who can represent us and, in a way that they can productively engage with the objective functions that we specify for these systems. Uh, that's one idea. Um, but yeah, so, so I think there is something different in doing this for AI, just because we have to be so precise. We can't, uh, we have to specify what the objective function is and we can't say, well, you know, at some point we'll ask a committee to weigh in on this or we have a jury of our peers or something uh, because many of these decisions are made instantaneously. Uh, and that I think is what's different. This becomes a real concern when, um the system is learning and you want it to learn to maximize that objective function of yours. Sometimes maximizing something takes it way out of the realm of where you want it to be. You know, if you say, I'd like a paper clip and suddenly a million of them are deposited on the floor in front of you because it gets more response that way. Julie, you have something to say about this. You, you, you're the one who thinks about people and machines working together. Yes, yes. So, uh, yes. So to build on uh, Vincent's point, it might it might sound you know fine enough. Well, you know, if we all just agree on that objective function, you know, it's it's precise, it's mathematical. Uh, you know, we can confirm it aligns to our values. We should we should be good. Um, so now I'll, I'll I'll give you the perspective of a roboticist that deploys real dangerous robot systems to operate in very close proximity to people in factories, <laughs> and. Um, uh, you know, once you aim to do this, what you quickly realize is that it's very, very hard to craft an objective function that produces the behavior that you desire in all of the different scenarios that are important to you. Uh, and what you then further realize is you actually have a challenge in identifying the right test cases to give the system so that you can build your understanding of how the how the system is it will behave. Um, uh, in order for, you know, obviously a person interacting with the system needs to be able to predict where it's going to be, to be able to work uh, effectively and fluently with it. Um, and so, uh, you know, you, you, you have challenges today where using state-of-the-art, you know, motion planning algorithms, um, uh, there's, uh, you know, methods, you know, we and others are developing to identify like the key test inputs that can, uh, that can elucidate behavior in certain um, spaces that are, that are of interest or the behavior will be very different than in um, a large portion of the rest of the sort of quote unquote space in which um, the system will operate. Um, but it's very, very challenging. We have current limits in our technology to be able to interrogate uh, and, and, and build our own understanding of how these systems will behave. Uh, even when you have a guarantee, a mathematical guarantee, that is very difficult to translate into sort of a person's mind of what that will mean for working uh, with a system. Um, and then, um, you know, along along similar lines, Jillian mentioned um, explainability. So, uh, you know, and, and so the, the the it's it's very important sort of in thinking about governance and policy to understand the limits of current capabilities for explaining um, these models. If you think about neural nets. Um, uh, and a, a simple analogy for them is they're like very, very fancy high dimensional function approximators, like you're, you're curve fitting in a very, very high dimensional space. So now if you want to be able to explain the behavior of that system with a with a um, smaller set of uh, rules or representation, it's naturally not gonna capture the full fidelity of how that system will behave. Um, 
And so uh, actually, even when you produce an explanation for one of these systems, it, it, it can very easily disadvantage certain segments of people if you don't know, say your data is representing people in some way. Um, because it's an approximation in and of itself. And so, again, you have this uh, process by which you really have to critically you know, dive in and understand, uh, again, the, the boundaries um, of uh, what it is you're getting as output, even of explanations of, of the system you know, that you're trying to build your understanding of. Uh, so all of it is a lot of work, and we're pushing the boundaries of, the, of our capabilities to be able to do this. Um, but none, none of these problems individually are solved yet. So I know, Francesca, that you're working with a variety of worldwide organizations. And when I said align a machine, an agent with our values, I kept thinking about the fact that values are culturally determined in some sense. How on earth are we ever going to get uh, agreement in, in, a, in a situation where the values not only vary with individual, but with social group or economic group or nationality is there hope there yeah well uh let me first say something about the other i mean the previous question oh. where i think that value alignment in my view is the typical um challenge that needs to be addressed by combining different AI techniques. You know, as you know, AI as machine learning, data-driven approaches, and then rule-based, symbolic, logic-based approaches. In my view, in order to understand how to embed these, our values, whatever they are, then when we get to the problem of what these values are, into machines, you need to use a combination of those. So it's a, a, a typical challenge that you need to use these uh, so-called new symbolic AI, where you combine different techniques of AI really to, to solve the challenge. Um, so in terms of these global approaches, yes, there are a lot of global uh, and multi-stakeholder, but global in terms of geography organizations that try to um, agree on shared values and principles. But of course, uh, different countries already, they have different legal systems. Why do they have different legal systems? Because uh, as uh, Gillian said, the legal system already reflects the values of that uh, region of the world, of that uh, country. So already the legal system tells you that uh, the, the, um, uh, the values are uh, prioritized uh, in different ways. So uh, mm -hmm. even, even, about, uh, even, even within regions of the world that are kind of closer because they are, uh, they are both in the Western region like Europe and US, of course you have different uh, legal system, for example, for privacy. You have the GDPR in Europe, you don't have something like that in the US. So uh, already you see that the values are different or prioritized in a different way. So the, you cannot expect that at some point this organization will state, okay, these are the values that we all, the whole world, the whole universe agrees on. Uh, but you can, I think that one can expect that there is some agreement or what are the main pillars of these AI ethics issues, um, like whether, and then the priorities will be given possibly in a different way. Um, there are organizations that are more uh, reaching out to uh, regions of the world with different values to, uh, to allow for engagement and discussion, even with the, um, with the countries that maybe regions of the world that don't really have the same similar values. But there are other organizations that instead they say, say they try to put together countries that think alike, no? So like so uh, to get more consensus and maybe focus rather than in getting everybody, no matter the values, but you know, uh, getting more like uh, uh, focusing on reaching out to the divide in the south and north of the, of the developing and developed uh, countries. So there are various nuances where you want to be more inclusive. Uh, not, I didn't see yet an organization that want to be inclusive in all the different dimensions. Okay, let me just pause for a moment to invite the audience to put their questions in the Q&A in the box if they would like to, because we're having a wonderful time, but we have five minutes or so before we get to them, um, to my astonishment. Um, all right, so uh, Vince, you have uh, written about kidney exchange 
an embryo selection for in vitro fertilization recently. What do you think the prospects are for a one agent fits all approach? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I think it's really very context dependent, right? So you, uh, you mentioned kidney exchange. Uh, so what is a kidney exchange? A kidney exchange uh, is about the following problem. So sometimes somebody's kidneys fail and they would benefit from a transplant. Uh, they might get one from a deceased organ donor, but there aren't enough of those. Uh, they might get a live donation from a very close friend, let's say. Um, now, one thing that can happen is that the person that's willing to give is medically not compatible with the patient. Right? Maybe one has blood type A, the other has blood type B. And so you might think at that point, there's nothing else you can do other than to try to find a different donor. Uh, but in fact, there's one more thing that you can do is, which is that you might be able to exchange donors with somebody else, right? So that if I had blood type A and my uh, willing donor had blood type B, uh, another couple might be in the, say, in, the, in the inverse situation. So we could actually swap donors. And once you start thinking about that, many more possibilities uh, start arising. And so the best thing to do in some sense is to get everybody in this situation together or virtually together uh, and then figure out what the best way is to match everybody. But there are so many different possibilities uh, that it's very difficult for a human to go through all those possibilities and find the best one. So that's why AI is already being used there to search through all those possibilities. But that too is a case where we need some kind of objective function. Do we just want to maximize the number of transplants or do we want to prioritize certain people over other people, right? Or maybe it's just for tie breaking if there are multiple optimal solutions, but maybe in some cases, you know, so maybe one person, it's really urgent that they get a kidney transplant. And so we actually decide to give them one kidney rather than two other people uh, that we could have matched instead. But once you start thinking about that, then maybe you start taking into account how old the person is. And then maybe you start into taking into account whether they have other health issues and behavioral issues, like maybe they're a heavy drinker. Should you take that into account? Well, they have small children that they take care of, right? And you can kind of see where this might go. And probably at some point, this reasoning needs to stop and we need to limit the number of things that we take into account. Uh, but how do we do that? And also, uh, how do we actually relatively weigh those different issues, right? So that's something that we've been working on on asking people what the way is uh, to trade those off. Now, I think that's an example where you really just end up with a single objective function for everybody, right? If at least to the extent that we have only one exchange, uh, that exchange, that algorithm needs to run with one objective function. So there isn't really any room for personalization. In self-driving cars, it might be a little bit different in principle. Now there too, maybe we don't want to allow everybody to set their car to the most kind of aggressive, like passenger protecting driving mode. Uh, because that would be kind of a tragedy of the commons that everybody would be unhappy with. But maybe there's some room for individualization that, you know, I want my car to be even more defensive, or I don't want my car to sway back and forth because I get car sick uh, mm -hmm. or something like that, right? And maybe we, you know, maybe there are special occasions, like if I'm driving somebody to the emergency room, maybe in those special occasions, I should be allowed to have my dr car drive a little bit faster and more aggressively. So there's some room. Uh, I think it will take us too far afield to really go into what you could do, but it depends a lot on the application. Okay. Um, robots have taken people's jobs and are likely to continue to do so. Julie, how can we mitigate that? Yeah, so uh, thank you for that question. <laughs> it's another question I spend a, a, a lot of time uh, thinking about. And so as I mentioned earlier, I work in um, collaborative robots over for many years in robotics for manufacturing. And um, as well as introducing systems in other sectors that have uh, that have um, you know not moved as rapidly over the decades for, for the introduction of the technology, but now we're at a changing point and the technology does become um, you know more useful in more contexts. Uh, and I think the most the most important point that I aim to communicate and aim to show via the work that that we do in the lab is that um, that we have a choice in how we frame the problem, and that drives investments in technology that can uh, push us towards you know one path or or another. So. Um, for example, if our aim is to supplant work in a, in, a, in a factory, well, that drives us towards, say, the automotive sector. Large portions of building a car are actually still done manually, even though you think about robots as building up your car. It's the final assembly of the car where you ma manipulate flexible materials, a uh, lot, very, very dexterous work that's still very hard for, for robotics to do. So it's just a whole sea of people building up that final part of your car. 
Um, and so, um, you know, investment in robotics is valuable for many reasons, um, but you can invest to enable systems to, you know, do that very difficult, dexterous work. Or, and this is this is what we pursued in our lab, you frame the problem differently. How do you value uh, this technology? Well, one way you value it typically is through a, a very simple labor displacement calculation. That's, that's an, by and large how um, the business case is made for introduction of industrial robots. In contrast, you can achieve the same value by um, looking at uh, benefiting productivity. Um, and doing that calculation, you can, um, uh, you know, it's, um, it's much more complex. It requires more technology in and of itself to be able to simulate a productivity improvement through um, more flexible integration of a robot system, almost working as like a surgical assistant to the person assembling the car. It's a different mode in which the robot is doing the non-value added work, supporting the person, much as an, a surgical assistant would support a surgeon in the operating room. But the, the value to the company in the end can be equivalent or greater by, by framing um, um, the introduction of the technology in this different way. And it drives investment in different AI problems, AI problems of manipulating flexible material or AI problems of making systems more flexible, of, uh, of, of monitoring, predicting human work, updating um, um, timelines uh, and tasks in response to a varying human partner rather than a static you know, schedule of, a, of another robot. Um, and so, um, uh, and what, what we've been able to show in our work is that investment in this type of technology and deployment of it can reap uh, substantial economic uh, benefits um, with, uh, you know, very positive sort of human side to enhancing human capability, improving ergonomics. Uh, and so we have this choice right at the beginning and how we frame uh, the problem, how we uh, communicate and agree upon our values, and then how we invest in, in technology um, to move forward. That's a terrific answer. Okay, Jillian, we're going to go to the audience questions now, and I've got one for you. Um, people interact with information through search engines. Should governments have oversight over the algorithms that Google, for example, uses to return search results? Yeah, I think, I think actually this is um, a really important point um, that uh, so we, we can think about search results, Vince mentioned those, uh, content recommendations, you know, our news feed, our movie, all of that, uh, our, our interaction with so much of the world in the digital space is being determined by systems being built within primarily private technology companies. And I think this is really um, a new world for us. Uh, and we, we recognize that it's not just, you know, my search results, it's actually having lots of systemic effects. I mean, both because of some of the biases we started with, uh, the way those systems work, we know that they can contribute to polarization. So I absolutely think that those systems are things that should be auditable and uh, capable of being regulated by governments. Now, I want to just respond a little bit to a comment that Vince made earlier about, you know, some of these decisions are made so fast. There's very, very high levels of complexity. Um, Francesca was talking about the global nature of this, all of which is absolutely true. And that's why I actually think that what we need to be doing is coming up with new ways of regulating. I don't think that our existing ways are going to be up to snuff because they're too slow. They don't deal with complexity well. And so much of what's happening is happening in these massive systems. These are truly massive systems inside private technology companies. Well, we built a whole bunch of rules around techno co companies in the 18th, 19th, early 20th century, things like trade secret and so on. And I think we need to be reconsidering all of that structure in order to be able to get these systems. These are, these are really fundamentally changing the way the world works. And we need fundamental rethinking of how we regulate for that. Um, and we, we're going to have to re-examine a lot of our questions about how we do this. It's, it's one of the topics I work on. Uh, but I, if just going to the question from, from the audience person, absolutely, I think those systems need to be uh, uh, su subject to some kind of oversight and uh, capacity for regulation. Wow. Okay. The, the questions from the audience are incredible. Um, AI has forced us to come to grips with a spe as a species with defining fairness, justice, human rights, which vary among communities, cultures, and different environments. 
should we leave this to the AI developers? And what's the alternative? Vince, how about you? Want to, you want to tackle yeah. that? That's a great question. It lines up very well, I think, with what I said before, right? That uh, I work closely with the moral philosopher, Walter Sinnott Armstrong here at Duke, who is absolutely amazing. Uh, but traditionally, the way we've taught ethics uh, at universities is very much not of the form that, you know, by the end of the course, you know the formula, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I've never seen an ethics course that, that's like that, that by the end of the course, the instructor writes on the board, well, this is the formula, now we've proved it and we can all go home now. Instead, usually the, the whole point of the course is to point out all the complexities and all the ways that your initial intuitions might be wrong. Uh, and so it's very much not about giving that formula. Uh, and yet that's precisely what we need uh, mm -hmm. in AI, right? And in some sense, whatever we implement, whether we really have like a precise objective function somewhere in the code or not, in the end, we have code that does something very specific, right? And so we can't really avoid uh, that specificity problem in a way that in the past, I think we could to some extent avoid it by saying that, well, you know, at this point in the process, we will have an ethics committee look at things and reevaluate things. Uh, here, when we're, you know, when we're writing code, it's going to be very precise and specific. Uh, so that's, I think, kind of a challenge. Uh, and then sort of the next part of the question, I guess, was, you know, should this be left to AI developers? And I would say no. And I think basically all the AI developers would also say no. I, I don't think they want this responsibility or this power. Uh, the problem is that it's hard to get others to weigh in on it uh, in a very precise way, right? Like many, again, as I said before, that, you know, we, uh, we often have this idea that, well, somebody will just tell us what the objective function is and we can just fill it in, right? That this is the blank in the code. Somebody is going to tell us what the objective function is. And that person doesn't exist, right? Even the entire ethics course can't tell us what that is. Uh, in a way, I kind of like that it makes the problem that specific and that it forces us to think about it. Uh, but it is, of course, ex extremely difficult because all those things that you learn in the ethics course about how your intuitions might be wrong, uh, there, there's real value to those insights, right? And so how do we bring those into something like an objective function or more generally, how do we bring those into our code? Uh, it's a very difficult question. I think it's definitely a question that will involve many stakeholders, definitely beyond the AI researchers and developers, but how to exactly set that up uh, in, in line with what Jillian said before, right? We need new systems for uh, figuring out how to do that. Julie, do you have any ideas about how everyday citizens might best participate in agent development, especially during the early technology phase? Yes, yeah. So um, I I think about this uh, a lot again from from the robotic side. So as you know, as as robots are uh, you know escaping our factories, you think about autonomous vehicles on our road, sidewalk delivery robots, security guard robots, um, service robots in hospitals and in other settings. You know these are these are embodied systems, but they are employing much much of this AI in perception and prediction um, and planning. And they're, uh, they're, they're essentially a new safety critical consumer technology, which is sort of a new class um, employing this, this technology. Uh, and um, it's, uh, you know, to, to, to Vince's point, um, this can't, you know, I, I, this absolutely cannot just be left to the technologists, to the, to the companies, to the developers. Uh, but we do have a lot of work to do to train the uh, our graduates, our engineers, our technologists um, to be able to bring a broader perspective to the work that they that they do, not just to bring others to the table, but to also be able to teach those that are at the creation point of this technology to be able to communicate about the technology they're developing and to be able to communicate across disciplines and beyond their um, uh, the sort of the technological sphere um, with social scientists, um, with policymakers. Uh, and so we, we have a, a large experimentation and effort underway, as do many other universities in incorporating material, almost in a very practical sense, like not teaching students moral philosophy, but, but bringing uh, this broader perspective and uh, being able to tie tech, uh, um, development decisions like lines of code to values and be able to discuss those and be able to communicate and be able to gain feedback on the decisions that are, that are being made. Um, as a, as a private citizen, watching these systems increasingly being deployed around me, you know, there's 
uh, from, from how they change the fabric of our you know, everyday lives, our neighborhoods. Um, there's precedent here too for wider community involvement in, in understanding you know, how we shape the use of these technologies. Um, uh, if you think about um, communities, when when an airport changes the traffic pattern, say, <laughs> you know, it, it impacts property values, uh, and there is there are community meetings and input, uh, very you know, very important processes around that. Uh, as these systems are deployed um, at scale, it becomes equally important that uh, communities have input as well as to uh, the sort of continuous test and deployment. Um, uh, and uh, have a, have feedback and influence over um, how this changes, you know, and affects uh, the daily lives. It was a few years ago, there were so many sidewalk delivery robots deployed on the streets of San Francisco that there was a revolt. <laughs> I think the elderly and people with disabilities went to the city and they said they just felt unsafe with so many systems. I was at a conference and overheard someone uh, from San Francisco complaining very loudly about it. And as a result, the systems were, were temporarily removed from the most populated areas of the city and relegated to an industrial sector. Um, and that's a, that's a negative outcome, right? That's a situation where systems are being tested in, away from people. They can't be matured in the way that they need to to be able to provide value to us integrated into our everyday lives. Um, and so we need better, um, better and regular mechanisms for, um, uh, for, for engagement in order to be able to drive this technology in a way that can be maximally valuable to us at scale. OK. All right, so I have a question I'm hoping someone will give me a very positive answer to. Not my own. I'm going to read it. It's a bit long. I am not hearing much that gives hope here. Biased people using biased data on opaque machines for profit are unlikely to solve the problem. Given that biases have been found in AI applications in every field, medicine, housing, hiring, education, the list goes on. What reason is there to think we can make progress? Historically, bias is addressed by those who are oppressed. How can we make progress without diversifying the field? No, right. yes, that's for you. Yeah, so <laughs> definitely, definitely the, the field needs to be diversified. You know, for example, even uh, with respect to gender or many other dimensions, of course. Uh, but there are a lot. But the, the the positive thing is that there are a lot of efforts in this. Uh, you know, making the field more diverse. In uh, even in starting early. You know, and giving role models so that uh, even uh, uh, girls. You know, the, the young girls can uh, see that they can uh, get into this field. Uh, and also in diversifying in also in the mind framing of the people that uh, follow these uh, scientific studies like with like what Vin said to include you know discussion about ethics in also in the scientific and technological studies so that the people that come out and then they build these systems have this uh, attitude and this different culture uh, but to go more on the positive note I think that not I think that uh, um, here I mean already the previous uh, question was uh, acknowledging at least that uh, if the more people think about uh, that AI forced us to think more about our values, right? So since we need to understand what values we want to put into AI, first we have to understand what are the values that we care about. And already this is a positive thing that we, we are more aware of what are the values that we really care about. And then AI itself can help human beings actually to, um, to improve our own awareness and our own, because we are not perfect, right? So we have bias, we have many limitations. So we are not perfect. Also, once we draw our values, we are not really perfect on going and following these values, right? So, and I think that the technology can also help us in that respect. For example, there are systems that help uh, uh, even uh, not deciding, but helping and supporting hiring managers in considering more diverse uh, candidates uh, short list, for example, or things like that. So not only, so to, I always say my end goal is not to improve AI. I mean, I, can, I don't care about improving AI per se. The goal is to improve people, to improve our society, to improve our world, the way we live, we interact 
through the use of AI, you know. So and that in that respect, AI has to have the right property, has to have the right regulation, the right auditing, and all the pieces that we want. But I mean, or the ultimate goal is to improve ourselves and and uh, and uh, being more aware of our values. And I think that the uh, the um, creating AI agents is helping us really to think more about our values. And this is already a positive thing because then once we are more aware of our values, we will put that into everything we do in our everyday life. Wow, I can't think of a better answer to that question. I'm really glad I asked you. <laughs> Although I'm sure that everyone in this uh, group has had just wonderful answers. It has been, we're actually a little bit over the witching hour now. I can't thank you all enough. And I'm going to say good night and thank our audience for joining us.